songwriting for me is the thing that makes me feel um, special in some way. Uh, that, 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 that I feel elevated in some way. It's the, one, it's the one aspect of my life where I don't feel mediocre. We were married under cherry trees Under blossom we made our vows All the blossom comes sailing down Through the streets and through the playground the sun would stream on the sheets Woke by the morning birds We'd buy the Sunday newspapers And never read a single word People, Many people thought the Australian singer and songwriter Nick Cave wouldn't live beyond the 1980s. When he and his band, The Birthday Party, arrived in Britain at the beginning of that decade, their concerts were orgies of self-hatred, audience disdain and ear-bleeding intensity. A skeletal and confrontational frontman, Cave's lifestyle was as extreme as his performances and he seemed to be heading for a drug-fueled rock and roll implosion. Yet, alongside this violent persona was a serious musician. And 20 years later, backed by his band The Bad Seeds, Cave is now one of the most acclaimed songwriters of his generation. He was born in 1957, the son of an English teacher. Cave's influences are as much literary as they are musical. And in 1989, he published a critically acclaimed novel called And the Ass Saw the Angel. He's acted in several feature films and written screenplays, but it's for his songwriting that he's most well known. In Archipel South Bank Show, we look at the world of Nick Cave through his songs and the artists that inspired them. Well, my daddy left home when I was three and he didn't leave much to Ma and me. Just this old guitar and an empty bottle of booze. Now, I don't blame him because he run and hid, but the meanest thing that he ever did was before he left, he went and named me Sue. Well, I grew up quick and I grew up mean. My fists got hard, my wits got keen. Roamed from town to town to hide my shame. But I made me a vow to the moon and stars. I'd search the honky-tonks and bars and kill that man that gave me that awful name. Watching the Johnny Cash show on TV with my mum and dad when I was, I suppose, about nine years old or something like that. It seemed like the most radical thing I'd ever seen. The man in black. I hadn't even thought of music as being kind of an evil thing before. And it was Johnny Cash who, who sort of put that spark into me, I think. Nick the Stripper was as close to a pop song as the birthday party ever got. It was a kind of celebration of evil. A very strange, twisted little song. Nick the Stripper's in the great tradition of rock and roll self-aggrandizement. That's just, you know, it's a song about the singer himself, you know, like a Bo Diddley song or something in a kind of perverted form. It's about Nick being wild and uncontrolled and untamable. What the birthday party were doing was putting forward some version of hell, but it always felt like we were reaching up from the gutter in some way. My father was uh, an English literature teacher and he was very much interested in poetry and theatre as well. Uh, and he always considered the written word to be at the top. 
and I suspect that he considered rock and roll to be at the bottom. His father had instilled in him this love of literature and this sort of refreshing way of interpreting books, including the Bible, you know, as a work of literature. It's, it's quite important to, to say this, as much as there is faith in Nick's songs, there was always this sense that he can play around with the sources, including the Bible. And um, God's always there on his shoulder. So there is no place for crime to hide. A little church is painted white, and in the safety of the night, we all go quiet as a mouse, for the word is out. God is in the house. God is in the house. I was three years in the choir, so I had quite a good understanding of, of the Bible just from being in church a lot. Once I started art school, I became very interested in the religious painters, and I started to read the Bible a lot, especially the Old Testament, and was just fascinated by what I read. My songs started to fill up with this kind of imagery. I guess I gave up reading the Old Testament after a while because it seemed to be having a bad effect on me. Um, and I think my lyrics were starting to labor under it somewhat. Uh, and I, I, I started reading the New Testament. What attracts me to Christ is that he's baffling because he is a divine figure, but he's, he's acting very much as a human being. And, uh, and in that regard, he is understandable. God is in the house came about from driving through small town America with my wife on our honeymoon. And we met people and we talked to people and there was that idea of civic pride coupled with a fear of, of the evils of the outside. Homos roam in the streets in packs, queer bashers with tired jacks, lesbian counterattacks that stuff is for the big cities. Our town is very pretty, we have a pretty little square and a woman for a mayor. Our policy is firm but fair, now that God is in the house. It's really about community, and, uh, and there's a lot to be said for that, I think. Um, but there's also, I guess, it's restrictive in some way in that it's often fearful. Fear of the outside closing in. Post crucifixion, baby. Post crucifixion. And all our stuff. Oh, oh it's a wild world. Oh, it's a wild world. Oh, it's a wild world. Hey! It's a wild world. That's a wild world. Hey! Yeah! Hey, 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 hey! That song is about two people against the world. And I think that a lot of my songs are about two people against the world. I saw the world as a kind of punishing place, a bad place, a place of chaos. Certainly my life felt like that. We drank a lot. We experimented with drugs. Um, we had, we took a lot of drugs, um, took a lot of drugs for a long time, um, and our, uh, yeah, I mean, our life was, uh, our life was 
yeah, lives were very much reflected by, by the kind of music that we played. Scratch, scrape, scratch, scrape, scratch, scrape, scratch, this winning thing. It was clear it was a dead end, that if we wanted to continue to do something, we had to change. I went back to Australia. I, I think I sort of drifted around for a year or so. Um, and I think Mick sort of found me and, uh, and put the idea of starting another group. And so we put together Bad Seeds. The Bad Seeds were a much more focused band. They were, and I'd not patronize them in any way, but they were Nick Cave's backing band. Whereas the birthday party was this maelstrom of noise where every part was sort of equal and often equally disordered. Whereas this, to me, felt like quite an old-fashioned band um, who, were, who were there to do a job, and that job was to illustrate these lyrics and illustrate that music. The lyrics became more focused. Words weren't just used as, as kind of weapons. They were used to, to put across a, my particular idea of the world at that time. Tupelo is based on John Lee Hooker's extraordinary song about the flood of Tupelo. Have a long time ago. A little country town. Tupelo, Mississippi. It rained and it rained. I remember first hearing him when I was 19 or 20, and uh, it was just one of those moments where, where um, the, the tone of his voice, um, the kind of like laconic way he put this line across, the guitar playing, which, is, which, which was extraordinary and kind of radical guitar playing, um, you know, it, it really redefined all my ideas, I think, that I had up to that time. That was women. Double children, just dreaming and trying. Lobby, I'm no one to turn to but you. Please save us, Lord. Little country town, two below the city. Yeah. 
Nina Simone is hugely important to me. She is the real thing. We were obviously far from the experience of the blues people. But for me, from a literary point of view, there was just, there, there was just an extraordinary, uh, brutal, haunting use of words. Ain't got no home, ain't got no shoes. Ain't got no money, ain't got no class. Ain't got no skirts, ain't got no sweaters. Ain't got no perfume, ain't got no love. Ain't got no faith. I ain't got no culture. Ain't got no mother, ain't got no father, ain't got no brother, ain't got no she sang other people's songs better um, because of uh, how surprising and, and uh, her renditions were and how much she made them her own. Not that many years ago I was hosting Meltdown South Bank and I was called to her room and she was sitting in a wheelchair huge with kind of uh, gold kind of Cleopatra makeup on and this sort of a horrific expression on her face and sort of sitting around the edge of this room were these kind of her, her kind, of, kind of flunkies who were kind of all quaking in fear of this woman and um, I asked her, you know what do you want and she she said I want you to introduce me I want you to get it right and um, I said okay and she said I am Dr. Nina Simone she was so terrifying and so belligerent I'm like okay fine and then she did the concert. She sat down at the piano, took the gum she was chewing out of her mouth and stuck it onto the Steinway and, uh, and glared at the piano like it was her enemy and just thundered into this song. As the songs progressed, they got more and more beautiful and she became um, inflated with the whole thing and it was just an absolutely chilling thing to see. And uh, by the end of it, she'd been kind of transformed and redeemed in some way. It's very different from where I used to live. Yes, it's. Um, I, I operated in a very small area in, in Kreuzberg, I think, and, and I, I probably didn't really get to know Berlin very well. Everything that I needed was in Kreuzberg. It, it was an incredibly vibrant, exciting place. We weren't getting uh, the kind of recognition we thought that we deserved from London, really. We did a concert in Berlin. 
we were kind of, I guess, adopted to a degree by the, the Berlin scene. He was the, the reigning king of darkness in Berlin. And of all the dark and grungy places, he would show up late at night. They were the underground heroes. And people dressed like Nick and spoke like Nick. And I mean, there was a real reverence. He was the reigning king. Everybody here came from somewhere else. Uh, any artist coming from New York or every musician coming from Australia would be very much welcomed in West Berlin just because of them. Yes, please be here. Tell us that this is a great place. Tell us, please, this is a great place. We would like to believe it. It is a great place. We live on the edge of poverty, but this is a great place. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is my room. I lived in Dresden, Strasse, in this little room, decorated with a lot of uh, religious paintings and, and uh, pictures of um, naked women all over the walls. And uh, big buxom women. But in that room, I wrote the mercy seat. of Jesus in my soup, those sinister dinner deals, the meal trolleys, wicked wheels, and the foam rising up from my food, all things good or ungood. Mercy seat is a kind of Nick Cave and the Bad Seed standard, really, um, but only because uh, the song lends itself to many different interpretations. Interpret silent catalog, a black and toothy scarlet bomb. The walls of that black bottom kind, or the other sick breath that died, or the other sick breath that died. The other sick breath of mine, the other sick breath get rid of. extraordinary song, you know, written uh, in the voice of someone waiting on death row and reflecting on their life and not being apologetic or not being regretful uh, and not being afraid to die. And I thought, you know, it, it had all that deep, dark southern gothic in there. It had the blues in there. And it also had this weird Old Testament feeling of I did what I did and an eye for an eye and now it's my turn. My kill hand is called evil. Where's a wedding band that's good? Tis a long suffering shackle, coloring all their rebel blood. A mercy seat is a way down, and I think my head is a burden. In a way, I'm a yearning to be done with all this away and off the truth. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and anyway. Through the years in Berlin, I was writing my uh, book, 
And the S or the Angel. And pretty much that's all I did. I just sat in this room uh, day and night um, and tapped away on this manual typewriter. It was his brother who tore the call on that the morning of their birth. And as if that sole act of assertion was to set an inverted precedent for inertia in his life to come, Euclid, then unnamed, clutched a hold of his brother's heels and slopped into the world with all the glory of an uninvited guest. The book is about a, a small religious community in a town called Euclid. The dealings of these people are all watched over by a boy who lives up in the hills who is a, is a mute um, called Euclid Eucro. And uh, he feels he is betrayed by the townsfolk and seeks to bring their cult to its knees. The noonday sun spun in the sky like a molten bolt and hammered down upon the tin roof and tarred plank sides of the shack. Inside sat Pa at his table, surrounded by his ingenious contraptions of springs and steel, sweating midst the bleeding heat while greasing his traps and trying in vain to closet his ears from the drunken ravings of his wife. It's like some strange hybridization, a kind of demented uh, implant of deep south Gothicism into a harsh Australian soil. In terms of an orthodox narrative, I don't think it's uh, necessarily one of, the, one of the most gripping novels, but it is what is significant about it is that it is beautifully written, and it's of a piece with the lyrical sensibility. I mean, the book itself is certainly a product of the lifestyle that, that I was living. And, and yeah, indeed, the songs that were written around that time. Past the ivy covered windows of the angel, down Athenaeum Lane to the cathedral. Through the churchyard I wandered, sat for a spell there, and I pondered. My back to the game My back to the game My back to the game Of the garden This is the Angel Hotel in uh, Bury St Edmunds. Periodically, I would uh, look at a map and go to, to places that were sufficiently far away from uh, the temptations of London and kind of hole up in a, in a hotel for a few weeks and kind of clean up, take the cure. I need to get away from London because uh, my, my drug taking it was, was way out of control, basically. And, uh, and this is the sort of thing someone in that position kind of does, I guess. You know, I mean, uh, in regard to taking drugs, it was just something that I did. I think it was something that everybody did. Um, you know, it's the one job in the world where you can actually arrive at work stoned out of your head or completely drunk and everyone applauds you. I wrote a song called Gates to the Garden which is about looking out this window and the journey down to the cathedral and the, the churchyard next to it. Fugitive fathers, sickly infants, decent mothers, runaways and suicidal lovers. Assorted boxes of ordinary bones Aborted plans and sudden shattered hopes All in unlucky rows Yes, in unlucky rows Oh, in unhappy rows Up to the gates of the garden I'm not exactly sure about why this is, but some of the more optimistic songs, which, which in a way this is, um, came out of, the, uh, out of the most dire sort of circumstances. It doesn't surprise me to learn that it was written off the back of a geographical from uh, Nick's experience of active addiction, because, you know, that's a, a state of mind that I'm familiar with myself. And, you know, William Burroughs, another addict writer, described 
the image hunger that occurred to him in withdrawal from heroin and the kind of uh, intense nostalgia, almost sickly sweet nostalgia that, that accompanied it. Won't you meet me at the games? Won't you meet me at the games? Won't you meet me at the games to the garden? For me, the great love songs certainly are the ones that have within it uh, an ache. It is that ache that gives, gives it uh, its depth. It's the melancholy. I married my wife on the day of the eclipse. Our friends awarded her courage with gifts. Now's the nights grow longer and the season shifts. I look to my sorrowful wife Who is quietly tending her flowers Who is quietly tending her I do agree with Nick when he, when he says, when he, when he gives the, uh, the love song, not just as a genre, but within the whole field of songwriting, a particular high status. I do agree with that, and I do think that like the non plus ultra, the, uh, the, the ultimate song is a love song. The Nick Cave love song is all, always distinctly different from a love song per se that someone like Bert Bacharach would write or Lennon and McCartney would write, um, tends to be sorrowful, tends to be mournful, tends to be full of melancholy, tends to be about lost love. I read this essay by Lorca. He talks about that being this uh, unexplained sense of, of um, sadness and sorrow and things. And I think that that's preoccupied me for, for quite a while. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's this essence in the love song um, that gives a, a love song its depth, its spirituality. The water is high on the beckoning river and a mingery promise I could not deliver and the cry of the birds is a terrible shiver through me and my sorrowful wife Who is shifting the furniture around Who is shifting the furniture around The sorrowful wife is a good example of, of, of what I'm talking about because it is setting up idyllic, Arcadian situations but something is not quite right so that the song takes on a melancholy form, but it is actually a, a love song, it's a wedding song. We sit beneath the knotted yew, the bluebells bob up around our shoes, which is where I sat with my hugely pregnant wife at Kew Gardens, and it was an idyllic situation. Now we sit beneath the knotted yew, and the bluebells bob up around our shoes and the task of remembering those telltale clues goes to my sorrowful wife who is counting the days on her fingers who is counting the days on her there's something that attracts me to the pastoral setting or the idyllic setting that's on the point of collapse that 
this, this kind of uh, beauty that we can take hold of at times is very, very fragile. When it comes to the idea of using the, the actual kind of meat of your relationships with other people in your art, uh, it's actually what defines a serious artist. Uh, you know, the problem with, with uh, a lot of popular music is that it makes those references so general as to be anodyne. The more personal songwriting, I suppose, came about with The Boatman's Call. And as much as I love that record, there's an element to that record that, that um, disgusts me. Uh, in the sense that, that, that I think at that time I, I was like some kind of thing that sort of sought out disaster. Um, you know, and kind of digested it and sort of excreted it out again in the form of a song. In the case of a couple of songs on that album where clearly people are going to know who the song is about, I don't think that that's really advisable. I don't, I don't feel very comfortable with that. With a bird sing bass. Got a house, big heart where we all live uh, and plead and counsel. And for the elder, her widow's peak, her lips I've kissed, her glove of bones hanging off her wrist that I held in my hand. Her West Country Girl would be a, a very good example of a song that is specifically about someone and I think it's, it's pretty well known now that it, it was about his relationship with, with Polly Harvey, another singer from the West Country. I don't think it does the, song any, uh, the, the songs any favours that, that you can't listen to a song and think well that's about that and that's about that person and, and that was what, that's what was happening in, in his life at that particular time and all of that sort of stuff. You don't need all that baggage. Recently, I've, I've tried to take a more detached, objective role in writing songs. Even though they are still autobiographical in a sense, I feel I'm standing more outside of the whole thing, and in that way they are possibly more inclusive. He Wants You is about a, a man uh, moving towards the object of his love, uh, who waited asleep in an idea-free sleep. She hadn't yet been born, completed, until she, until he, until he kind of penetrated her with the force of his love, and uh, he moves slowly towards her, and uh, and really that required a kind of circular um, caudal structure. Um, so that so that the the uh, the, the 
structure of the song didn't lock down the the uh, the, 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 the lyrical line too much, and the, and the lyrical line could flow through it. So um, it just became a, a, a series of a circular series of chords with a kind of nifty little uh, melody. Many stars wave, he will move all amongst your tangled hair and peep into the sea. Ooh, he'll awake and walk and draw the blind and feel some presence there behind and turn to see what that may be. Well, babe, it's me, and he wants you. With the, with the song He Wants You, I don't think it's autobiographical in the sense that I sat down with a particular person in mind, but it's a dreamlike song. You know, it's a fantastic, fantastical song. His songs really deal so much with a, with a desire for a pure love or with a desire for, with this, with this longing for peace in spite of all the unrest and in spite of all the in spite of all the turmoil that's happening inside of him. I think a lot of his love songs are really uh, songs of a spiritual yearning dressed in Anne Summers. Um, that's perhaps a slightly trite image, but, but in some sort of uh, erotic finery. Uh, and I think the fact that he's displaced it to the third person makes that all the more evident. W.H. Auden uh, talked about the traumatic experience waiting to happen, that the child waits for it to happen uh, in order that his life becomes a serious matter. So for me, that was the death of my father when I was 19. He died in a car accident. Um, he was there one minute and gone the next. Um, and that... And that uh, I mean that you know that had a huge impact, uh, and for for many years, and still does, I, I imagine, uh, over what I what I've done creatively. Um, I mean, very very much after that, I left Australia, and uh, I just uh, you know very much you know I, I can see this now, but it was very much about that that I just kind of rocketed forward and and kind of didn't really stop. My memory of it is that he just put it away very quickly and then moved on and didn't really deal with it at the time, which, you know, is then, of course, it's going to come back. And uh, it's certainly in the 80s it came up at one stage and he denied it outright, but then that's to be understood. I think he, he kind of came to terms with it and saw it for what it was quite recently. Perhaps, I don't know, perhaps these were uh, songs that I was writing, that, that I was writing were, were kind of songs 
for my father in some way, or, or it's some way of keeping the, the idea of my father alive in some way. I often have a feeling of, of, of my father being present in some way. There may be an element of, of me writing songs to him, but I'm not so sure about that. To each burn a candle for you, to make bright and clear your path, and to walk like Christ in grace. 